Thank you everyone for joining. This is the first lecture of four that we'll be running for this fall lecture series. Um, I'll be talking today about outcome measures. Um, so what exactly is an outcome measure? That'll be the first thing that we talk about today. Um, what are the characteristics of a well-defined outcome measure for your trial? What are the different types of outcome measures that we can uh, choose from for our study? And uh, we'll run through some examples and uh, clinical trials.gov reporting and, and how that pertains to uh, outcome measure selection. Um, and I thought this was a fitting quote to help orient people to this issue. Um, the best designed and most rigorously executed procedures cannot make up for a poorly chosen measure. Important knowledge about the impact of the intervention may be lost because the selected measure was unable to capture it or even worse, distorted the true results. So firstly, we'll talk about definitions and a couple definitions that are gonna be relevant for the discussion surrounding outcome measures um, to clear up any potential confusion or misinterpretation. So the first definition is for procedure or scientific procedure or medical procedure. And this is a test that is administered during a clinical trial. Um, and contrasting that with specifically what we would call an outcome or other synonymous term as an endpoint, um, this is the actual event or measure that is derived from the procedure that is observed for a particular person during the study. The objective is the goal of the study or a specific portion of the study. And the hypothesis is the predicted result of the study or a portion of the study. And so to walk through a quick example of what that would look like. So a blood pressure reading or blood pressure, you know, administering a blood pressure reading would be considered the test. The outcome could be of many potential outcomes, uh, the change in systolic blood pressure between six months and baseline, for example. So when we talk about what's your outcome measure, we don't wanna just say, oh, we're gonna take blood pressure. We, have, we wanna try to be as specific as possible. And the goal for this would potentially be something like to determine the effects of drug on systolic blood pressure between two groups or, you know, depending on the, the, form, the formatting of your study. And a potential hypothesis might be that the drug will reduce systolic blood pressure over the six month observation period. So this is sort of where terminology and language is actually important to statistics because all these things have slightly different uses in talking about statistical plans or writing your protocol. So it's important to kind of understand why each of these things sort of have a different place in the protocol and how we can be as specific as possible when writing about these different aspects of the study. And you know, why do outcome measures matter? Well, as the quote alludes to, well-chosen, well-specified outcome measures will help us do a lot of things, um, one of which is have more streamlined statistical discussion. So it really helps the conversations that you can have with your statistician, making sure everyone's on the same page. You have a better likelihood of a reliable, reproducible, meaningful study result. You potentially have increased generalizability because your measure has been very well specified uh, for whatever population you're using or um, in what scenarios that you're taking this outcome measure. Um, you may have less likelihood of wasted resources if your trial is run as effectively as possible. And more administratively, you have much more straightforward reporting to clinicaltrials.gov, and we'll talk more about this towards the end of the lecture. So moving on to characteristics of a good outcome, what makes a well-chosen outcome measure? Um, so I, this little asterisk here, I, some of these will apply to outcome measures as we define them. Some of these concepts could also apply to the test that you've chosen that you're using to extract outcome measure from. So you can kind of think of these characteristics in both of those ways, um, but uh, a lot of these concepts will apply specifically to the definition of the outcome measure that you extract. So we would wanna make sure that these outcome measures are objective, reproducible, unbiased, sensitive, and or specific, clinically relevant, feasible, chosen a priori, and easy to interpret and use in other settings. And we'll walk through 
each of these characteristics. So first, we want it to be objective. So, you know, maybe this seems obvious, but as much as is possible, we do not want to be, we do not want our measurements that we are taking to be influenced by the person taking the measurement. Um, so we would want this to be, to have whatever we're extracting to have clear guidelines for test administration, for extraction of measurement, uh, classification, things like that. Um, and maybe this is where we consider self self-reported versus clinician reported outcomes. Um, so in some settings, one of these or the other may be more or less appropriate. And so this is, you know, an important area to consider when we're talking about choosing our outcome measure and which of these is going to be, give us the most true result that we are after. Um, the second two uh, items I've sort of nested together here, reproducible, um, and unbiased. So reproducibility has a couple of different possible meanings here. One of which is the ability to obtain the same or very similar results on repeat administration. You know, in a scenario where you expect to get the same results, so this would be you know in, pa in stable patients, stable disease course, or um, scenarios where you're taking repeated measurements close to each other. We don't want it to be prone to errors or misclassification. And you know this concept is also related to inter-rater and intra-rater reliability, which is inter-rater is between two raters, so the same measurement taken between different clinicians or um, you know lab techs, things like that. And intra-rater reliability is the same measurement obtained by the same person at different times, or you know with some time lag between them. Again, where we expect to see no change. So we want to make sure that both of these things are considered when we think about reproducibility of, you know, a test, as I was kind of saying, or in the definition of the outcome specifically. And we also want to make sure that it's unbiased. So this means basically, you know, it has other statistical uh, definitions here, but we're basically just talking that it's measured with precision, that we are being accurate, as accurate as possible to the assumed um, underlying behavior in the patient. And I think this is well demonstrated in this, figure, which is showing visually what these things might mean. So we have high or low bias versus high or low precision or reproducibility, for example. And so obviously what we're striving for here is low bias and high reproducibility, where we're always getting these measurements sort of around what we intend to see. And conversely, we may have other scenarios of mismatch between these two, where maybe we're very precise, but we're kind of off off the target literally here in what measurements we're acquiring. And, you know, maybe we're close and, you know, in low bias, low reproducibility, we're around the right point, but we're too, we're too spread out. Our measurements are too variable to really give us enough power to say um, how the metric is behaving. And this would be like our worst outcome perhaps is very spread out and also off the mark. And so this maybe gives you a little bit more of an intuitive understanding about what these things might look like. Understanding all of these characteristics in your outcome measure or even your tests, generally speaking, are going to require either a lit review, a literature review, or just prior knowledge, prior research about how these things are behaving in your patient population. So you will maybe need to do a little legwork there too. Um, next is that it should be sensitive and or specific depending on your goals. So sensitivity, you know, just in terms of just statistical interpretation sensitivity is going to be our true positive rate. And those, so for example, those who test positive for an outcome among those who truly have the outcome and specificity being the true negative rate, those who test negative for an outcome among those who don't truly have the outcome. And so obviously these are not going to apply conceptually to all outcome measures. This is going to apply for a certain set of them and certain frameworks, but this is still important to consider when you're talking about uh, specifically binary outcome measures. So for example, we might talk about the presence or absence of uh, visual enhancement of a, you know, an MS lesion or another type of brain lesion. Um, how well detected is this, we might ask, or how sensitive or specific is our classification? How good is it at detecting what we're actually trying to detect or describing the underlying behavior? So having a baseline understanding of 
the metric that you're putting out there as being your primary outcome for your study, for example, and whether this is going to get at what you truly are trying to say about your patient population. Additionally, you might want to consider whether the outcome is sensitive to sensitive in a you know layman's term sense to the degree of clinical change expected in this population. So um, you know this is maybe a different a different side to sensitivity and specificity, just talking about what degree of change that we expect and, and will the outcome measure that we choose be able to well describe that. <clears throat> um, we wanna make sure that it's clinically relevant. Maybe this seems obvious too, or this is, you know, we expect all of these things to be clinically relevant, but maybe some of these are more likely to be used in a clinical setting. Maybe some of these have more function or uh, applied value in, in your field? Is it supported by previous research? Is there a lot of work being done in this area or are you kind of going out on your own with this new measure? You know, sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Um, and is it meaningful to both patients and clinicians? So we wanna make sure that what we are studying has this value either to both ideally or maybe you know, acknowledging the potential limitations in this area, but it's important to consider what our clinical relevance is. Um, the sixth characteristic that I'm listing here is feasibility. So sometimes this is a trade-off with clinical relevance. So sometimes we're not really able to get that best clinically relevant measure um, because it's not feasible to do so, right? So we wanna also acknowledge in our choice of outcome measure that some of these measures, some of the best measures may not be easy to collect. Uh, we may not have personnel, time, the lab space, et cetera, many other reasons um, to be able to use some of these measures. So all of this is important to consider when you're saying we, you wanna move forward with a specific primary outcome measure for your study. Can you actually collect it in the time span that you're intending to collect it? Um, seventh item is that it should be chosen a priori. So pre-specification of the outcome is really crucial for being able to do a proper sample size or power calculation. And changing this outcome measure, particularly a primary outcome measure, part of the way through the study may greatly invalidate the results of the study or, you know, in another way, make interpretability challenging or impossible when you're trying to create a final interpretation of what you found in your study. So we wanna make sure we think about all this stuff in advance and that we specify clearly and stably what that specifically primary outcome measure is gonna be. And um, the last item that we'll talk about for characteristics of a good outcome is that it should be easy to interpret and perhaps even use in other settings. So is this something that's going to be of broader use for your lab, for your group, or for other groups? Is this really going to have meaningful utility to use um, in follow-up trials, things of that nature? So you wanna make sure that this is going to be useful and that you're not putting all this work into recruiting patients for your study and you have uh, an outcome measure that's not going to really mean anything to anyone else or even your own group in the future. So now let's get into the specific types of outcome measures. So this is getting a little bit more into the, the details of this. So there are a couple different ways that we can talk about types of outcome measures. The first of which that I'll talk about is what I'm gonna call classification of outcome measures. So I'm breaking this into what you've probably seen as being primary, secondary, and exploratory outcome measures. So primary outcome measures are usually are uh, outcome measures for a study that are of the greatest importance. They often are going to have the most prior information, the most information in the literature or information within your lab. They are also possibly tentatively the most likely to show benefit. And I wanna be careful with this because you, know, you don't wanna just choose your primary outcome as being the one that's gonna get you the best publication, although that's what we all want. Um, but you do wanna consider whether or not your study is going to provide useful, well-powered information. And so I think this is still a useful thing to think about um, in, in this discussion. Um, the primary outcome measure is also the one that's going to be used to power the study. And often this is going to be a single measure 
support, maybe two, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Secondary outcome measures uh, are ones that usually will support the primary outcome. And the goal of these, and you know, perhaps this discussion isn't had enough. Why, what's, what's the distinction between secondary, primary, secondary, exploratory? Usually secondary are meant to provide uh, corroborating evidence or directionally related evidence um, to your primary outcome, or perhaps they are very important, very uh, potentially beneficial outcome measures, but we just have a, a little bit less information, prior information to help us with power calculations to do all these sorts of things. But these are going to be other key outcome measures for talking about our study. And then finally, exploratory measures. These are going to be metrics that are maybe new, somewhat less studied. Um, maybe they're not, there's really no prior information about what we would see on these outcomes in our study, in our uh, patient population. And often we'll use things here in this group to perhaps generate new hypotheses or to gather information for future trials. Um, I did want to put a note here that um, if your study specifically is a natural history study or a screening protocol, you know, we see other types of studies here, um, it may not really be necessary to follow this specific format of outcome measure classification. Um, and you may not have a framework where you would really fit these in, in one spot or the other. But most scenarios, I think, can be arranged where you have one primary question and then some key secondary and some exploratory questions. So primary and secondary outcomes in applicable trials must be reported to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this is something that I've talked about before. For those of you who you know, have been here, you know about this a little bit. These, it's just really important to consider this aspect when planning your protocol. Um, sometimes we get carried away with all the really cool things that we want to know, and we have a lot of really interesting secondary outcomes or even multiple primary outcomes. You want to make sure that you are really focusing yourself into clear, well-specified outcomes that are of interest and are able to be easily reported in some framework to clinicaltrials.gov. That's not to say that if it's going to be complicated to report some measure that we shouldn't have it as a primary or secondary outcome. So you do want to put everything in that you mean to put in, but don't flood your protocol with 15 secondary measures if none of, not all of them are really of equal importance. So do be a little bit choosy um, and don't feel like exploratory measures are kind of just thrown on the side. And I'll, I'll get into that too. Um, adjustment for multiple comparisons in the statistical way is usually only done, and this varies, I think, by statistician, but for me, um, the, I would usually only do this on primary outcome measures because the secondary outcome measure does not directly determine the success or failure of the trial, and power and type 1 error and all of those things specifically come from that primary outcome measure. And so in some scenarios, I've heard some statisticians say they don't even calculate p-values for secondary outcome measures or, you know, testing secondary outcome measures because of this. So just something to think about um, that we, you know, that primary outcome measure is really important in a lot of ways, and we want to be careful about not over-interpreting the behavior in some of the secondary outcomes um, because of power calculations specifically. And uh, exploratory outcome measures should still be well specified. So just because they are exploratory does not mean that they should not be thoughtfully defined. And we'll get into how we would do that in some of the examples. So we don't want to just dump outcome measures also into the exploratory section. We do want to think carefully about all of those things and have a well thought out plan for how we're going to talk about all of those metrics. And um, again, this is why I, you shouldn't feel so nervous to put some secondary outcome measures into exploratory because really there's not a huge gap between the way those things are thought about. And um, 
this is taken from um, protocols that we see here at NINDF. This is an empty shell table for the, the outcome measure section, essentially. So we can see this breakdown of primary, secondary, and exploratory. And, you know, ideally, we just have one item here, and you'll have a couple, probably more than three, perhaps, for secondary and, and so on for exploratory. But the objective, this specific definition of the endpoint, and, you know, a justification, which probably would highlight some of that, the things that I talked about for the characteristics of a good outcome or why you would choose it um, to be investigated specifically. <clears throat> so the next thing that I'll talk about for types of outcome measure is specifically the form, what I'm calling formulation of the outcome measure. So how we're going to take that test and turn it into something mathematical. So there are potentially many different ways we can do this depending on what question we're trying to answer. So I think it's important to also think about these things when we're trying to be specific about our outcome measure definition. So there's a couple key formulations. Of the first is continuous formulation. The second is binary. The third is categorical or ordinal, uh, similarly. And um, I'm also going to put time to event here. This is like a little bit of, I don't even want to call it a special case. It's, it's not really. Um, but like survival analysis or survival outcomes are considered sort of time to event outcomes. So these are all different possible ways that we can take the measurements from our study and put them, start putting them into that mathematical term. So continuous outcomes would be something like a continuous distance, um, a measured time in seconds, hours, things like that volumes, volumetric measurements from the brain, the percent, percent is a continuous scale, and some large range clinical scales with large, large totals. Um, so anything that you can kind of get a smoothish distribution of across your cohort, we'll think of as being kind of a continuous measurement. Um, binary outcome measures can be a binarized from a continuous variable. That would be a binary outcome measure. So some, any of these we could think of as being, any of the continuous measures we could think of as being also classified into binary categories. Um, this would also potentially be like an event occurrence. So um, whether they had a seizure um, or whether they have a new lesion appearing in a certain region of the brain, those would be binary. And categorical or ordinal, so our modified Rankine scale, is usually thought of as being an ordinal scale where it's a very, like zero to six, essentially it's a very short range scale with specific cut numerical outcomes. Um, a severity rating like mild, moderate, severe, that would be an ordinal. So they're taking specific measurements, but in an ordered way. And a count variable, um, this would also be considered not necessarily continuous unless the count is very large. Um, but the count variable, so for example, the number of seizures they had since their last visit or something of that nature, that would be considered um, kind of different from continuous or binary. So these are all different ways you can start to think about what you're going to try to extract from your trial. And then again, time to event, we can think of as being kind of a combination between continuous and binary. So really, uh, you know, time to death or time to stroke or something like that is continuous time and then a binary event occurrence and you know censoring behavior, which we won't get into, but really it's both of those things. So, um, but it, another type of outcome measure that you can use. So there's different pros and cons for the choices that you would have here. So continuous measures, really those are gonna be the best representation of the underlying biological process. So in a lot of ways that you know, true underlying behavior that you're trying to describe is going to be continuous. So this is going to get at that in the best way. Um, but we are black and white in the way that we sometimes want to make decisions. And so sometimes continuous data and continuous results can sometimes not be as clinically meaningful or it's really hard to translate into a binary decision-making framework. So what do I do? Um, what can I do with uh, you know, this data or what does this mean? Sometimes it's a little bit easier to think about in the in the, the binary framework. Um, for binary data, again, you know, the, think about the inverse of these pros and cons. But specifically, binary data, 
you know, will usually align best with that black and white classification tendency. It's really clean, um, it might be easier to interpret. Um, but again, you're losing some of that information from the continuous underlying process. Um, also, we may not have a good idea about what cut point to use if we're trying to talk about a binary version of a continuous variable. Where do we put that cut to make it binary? So that's also something to consider. Um, this would also potentially give us less information for future trials if you're, especially if you're talking about cutting a continuous variable into binary groups. So, you know, that, that you would kind of lose some value for the reader when they're trying to think about that continuous scale. Sometimes we would want to make a decision between continuous and binary when we are talking about CISC or primary outcome measure. And so in some cases, we would want to decide whether perhaps we want to use a continuous uh, motor function measure score, uh, which would be close to a, you know, the continuous measure, although it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes a percent which you know, may limit the range of analysis uh, that we can do. Um, or maybe we're just specifically interested in ambulant versus non-ambulant, and so we would want to think about what the goal of the study is. Uh, similarly, do we want to know about continuous blood pressure, or do we want to binarize it into high versus normal or low? Or you know, even further, would we want to talk about a three-level severity here of high, low, and normal, right? So these are all going to be important um, important things to consider as you <clears throat> as you write your protocol specifically. Um, again, also categorical or ordinal. So this is going to have a lot of benefits, so similar benefits to binary. Um, so we do have a little bit more of that interpretability from this. Um, but the analysis can be somewhat less straightforward for these types of outcomes, um, especially accounting for the ordered nature of these. It can be a, a little bit um, out of the usual analysis framework, but again, that's something you can talk with your statistician about. Um, so again, that would be, you know, continuous blood pressure or high versus normal versus low. And similarly, time to event. This is going to be something that would give us a lot of information, so combining the benefits of continuous and binary outcomes, and this is going to give us a really complete picture of what's happening here. Um, but these tend to be more difficult to execute, and you're going to need more patients, longer study duration, things of that nature. So um, not every framework is going to be well suited for that, that outcome measure. And um, next we'll talk about what I'm going to call styles of outcome measure. So as we start to piece these things together, uh, there's what I'm, I think three and then four on the next slide. Uh, type styles of outcome measures we can have. Um, so the first is co-primary. So we're specifically talking about co-primary endpoints. Um, so these are going to be two outcome measures that are, you know, separately collected, but perhaps are both of equal importance or interest to the, the study team or to the community. And in this case, we're going to need to adjust for type 1 error, um, you know, in a simple way, dividing by two for our alpha level, or you know, there are other things we can consider here. Um, but sometimes this is more complex to execute. But these will be basically separate outcomes we're going to look at in tandem to just talk about the the performance of the trial. Similar to that is going to be a composite outcome. So this is a single outcome measure, not side by side, but it's going to be a single outcome measure, but it's made up of distinct outcomes. So you may see this in the format of something like, uh, did they have a myocardial infarction, stroke, or death? So each of these is a separate event, right? But each person is classified in one way as either having or not having that, meeting that endpoint. So this is going to be better for rare events. Um, sometimes this requires a somewhat smaller sample size. But this is physically composite. You still get one metric from it, but it might pool information from multiple measurements in the study. Um, also, I, I think this is an okay place to talk about surrogate outcome measures, surrogate endpoints. Um, there's a whole literature on this, so I'm not going to talk about this too much here. Um, but this is something that we talk about for specific sorts of studies, and this is going to be a measure that's observed more easily or sooner or at lower cost than the true outcome of interest. So, for example, blood pressure reduction as a surrogate marker for stroke risk, right? So you're you're observing something and making inference about 
the underlying risk behavior or the, the underlying behavior that's happening in the patient. And these, they're gonna need to be validated when you use them as surrogate measures um, in order to make the conclusions you wanna make in your study. And then the fourth, I guess, type or style of outcome measure here that I wanted to talk about is the safety outcome measures. So these are kind of their own beast in a way. They're a little bit less straightforward to define, and I'm sure maybe some of you have seen this in your work, um, or a little bit less straightforward to work with, especially as a primary outcome measure. Um, and this is because we can't prove safety, and we can only show that no safety concerns were identified with the current sample size. So it, it, we see safety a lot more as kind of a secondary outcome in a lot of ways as sort of a descriptive um, supplement for what behavior you're seeing in the primary outcome or other outcomes in the study. And, um, you know, again, because we typically have it as a secondary outcome, you know, we're usually basing our sample size on something like an efficacy outcome versus a safety outcome, because it can be really hard to power on, on safety outcome measures. Questions about anything up to this point um, before we get into some examples? I haven't had anything come through chat. Great. Okay, we'll move forward. Okay, so um, the prime example that I'm gonna use here is from the uh, motor function measure scale or the MFM scale. So this is a um, scale that's used to measure function, physical function on 32 items. Each item gets a zero to three score for uh, you know, each question. And these are also measured across multiple domains. And so you can do sums across within each domain as well. And so that's the gist of what this specific scale looks like. So in a lot of studies that are interested in global physical function, this is a common outcome measure to see. So I wanted to use this as an example to talk about how we can use this measurement, this test to well specify the outcome measure. Okay, so uh, not to be harsh here, I mean, this is not using a specific example from anything that we've seen, but this is just gonna be a run through of, of how we can move from a bad specification to a much better specification. So uh, in your protocol, when you talk about your primary measure, if you just say, oh, my primary outcome measure is MSM, motor function measure, that's not gonna be enough detail needed to understand what specifically you're going to be looking at in your study. And so there are a couple issues with this. So the first is going to be, well, at what time point are you measuring the MFM? Is there a time dependent comparison of interest that you're talking about? Maybe time from baseline or time to six months, or uh, I'm sorry, change between baseline and six months, change between baseline and a year. And so this is going to really read more like a procedure, like a test than an outcome. And so we wanna be careful um, be careful of that that um, pitfall. And I think sometimes, it, you know, we we can be a little bit too short with the way that we describe these outcomes. And it's always better to have more detail here than, than, than less. So a much better version of this already would be something like, for example, the change in MSM 32 score from baseline to six months. So this is a lot better. So we can see we've specified change, we were looking at change and not just the measurement at a specific time point. Um, there are different versions of this scale. So we're specifically specifying the 32 uh, scale here. And we're talking about the change between two specific time points. And so that's also been clearly enumerated. So you might think, oh, there's not many issues with that. There's not, but there are some. So what exactly do we mean by change here? Like how are you defining a score, raw score, the percent of total on a specific domain, right? So I had talked about that there are domain scores here. So we wanna be clear that we're using, you know, perhaps the, the percent of the total or, um, you know, how we're talking about change. And so here is one best example for the framing of this as a potential primary outcome. So this, we could talk about this as being the percent change, for example. 
in total raw MFM32 score from baseline to six months calculated by six months minus baseline divided by baseline times 100%. So again, in this scenario, we've also specified whether we're using a total raw score versus some normalized percent score, which again, this will be specific to your scale, but it's just important to think about every piece of, of this and making sure that this is as reproducible and clear as possible. And so you might think, okay, there's really not much else we're gonna get out of this, but there, there's a teeny tiny bit and a little point that I do wanna make, which is that we, and maybe this is more just to, to highlight a point than to say that you need to write this, but I just wanna highlight that this is specifically subject level percent change. So we're calculating this percent change for each subject and outcome measures are always defined on the subject level. And so an outcome measure is something we're extracting for each subject. And the hypothesis of the study and the statistical plan is going to tell us what to do with those subject level outcome measures on the cohort level or talking about comparisons between groups, the, the, the inference there. So we maybe we wanna just point out that this isn't really like a change between treated and untreated groups, right? This is, we're talking about the percent change within person. So the subject level percent change in total raw MSM 32 score from baseline of six months calculated by things above. So that would be the absolute clearest way. And again, I think this is more just to point out to you all that this is all of these outcomes should be defined specifically on the subject level. So um, we can run through a couple more basic examples on some other types of procedures or measurements that we could see in studies. So the first would be with a modified rank and scale score, right? So one potential outcome measure could be favorable or unfavorable modified Rankin score from zero to two at 90 days. And so that is, we have a specific classification that we are showing that we are using and a specific time point that we are measuring it at. So that's gonna be classified again for each person. The inference that we are going to do or what we're going to do to claim significance would be specified elsewhere. The next example is you know, a procedure that we just broadly call cardiopulmonary testing, right? Okay, so that's a really good procedure and we have, you know, a whole section in the protocol to talk about what that testing will look like, but we wanna be clear when we talk about the outcome measure, what we are extracting and, you know, in another way, why, but for, for here, we're just talking about specifically what we are extracting. So one potential thing we could extract to look at would be the raw change in self-reported hours of daily ventilatory support use from baseline to six months. So we can see there's a lot of information in here that tells us about um, what this measure is and how we are extracting it. You know, we're extracting something in self-report. We're using this specific question that we asked them in self-report. This is a raw change and not a percent change within person. So again, these are all things that you wanna think about when you specify this. And the last example is the, a procedure of six minute walk test and a potential outcome measure that would be derived from this could be the six minute walk test distance in meters at three months post-treatment reported as percent predicted, right? And so some, some areas we have these normalized scores that we are comparing to healthy age, height, weight, and gender, you know, for example. And so specifically writing in your protocol that this is a percent predicted measurement will give a lot more information as to what exactly you're doing here and what your goal is. Questions about any of that? Okay, so the last portion of this, I do wanna run through some examples of what this looks like when you record to clinicaltrials.gov, and then I'll, I'll break for some questions at the end if there are any. Um, so reporting to clinicaltrials.gov, this is going to be for all applicable clinical trials. So ask CTU specifically if you're in this branch or not, um, for, for those of us who are with NINDS, of course. Um, so this would be, you know, they write here, all interventional clinical trials with one or more arms and with one or more pre-specified outcome measures. And um, you would report, you know, a variety of pieces of information, but of most relevance to this talk. Now, we're reporting sec primary and secondary outcomes, um, including any results of scientifically appropriate uh, statistical tests. 
but um, specifically, you know, talking about descriptive results um, for these outcomes. And so this is the template that is on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so generally, this is the sort of information you would need to provide for primary, secondary outcomes. The type, again, where you select um, what level of outcome measure it is, a descriptive title, and also another description if it's relevant. A time frame, again, we talked about how time specification is important here, and um, you know some other metrics on specifically how you are, like what, what um, measurement type this is really falling into here, and the unit of measure. So if you've done all the proper legwork in writing your protocol, this should hypothetically be very easy and should just require some tabulation of your group and on these metrics on the, on the cohort level. Um, but in some cases where our protocol is written either a while ago and it's kind of a holdover from previous versions or we you know, weren't able to specify some of these things as clearly, this can be pretty difficult to do. So I think this is a good and one good endpoint to think in mind when you're writing your protocol, having this, you know, can we fit these things into this sort of framework? It, would this, is this specified well enough for us to be able to write these things into clinical trials like us if our, if our study is applicable trial? So one example that they actually provide is this from, this is from their website. Um, so this example here is a primary outcome measure, which they're titling number of participants with myocardial infarction, stroke, or death from cardiovascular causes. So this is a composite outcome. And they describe here participants were monitored for up to two years. This is the number of participants who have had at least one myocardial infarction or stroke, or if they died from cardiovascular causes during the time of observation. So again, this is very clear, and they also provide the time frame, which is up to two years. And so their study, I, you know, it appears that it has two groups, one which is a low-dose aspirin therapy and the other which is beta blocker therapy. And, you know, it asks you to put in the overall number of patients here. And then the measure type, you would select the number of participants in each group that, um, that met this, right, as starting to sort of get at, you know, the compiling of this, this uh, outcome measure here. And so at the bottom here, we have 277 people in the low-dose aspirin therapy group and 246 in the beta blocker group that met this uh, criteria. And again, the unit measure is participants because we're talking about the count of participants. The second example is another primary outcome measure. And this is listed as the percentage of participants achieving predefined antibody level of greater than 0.1 international units per milliliter for tetanus toxoid. Um, <clears throat> again, th this is like where it's a little bit, this is, this is talking about collapsing information across participants. So our, our true outcome measure here is actually whether or not this person achieved, right? And then we're talking about compiling that information within group as a percentage. So it's like a little bit fuzzy, that distinction between subject level and group level summaries. But as long as your subject level definition is clear, you'll find a framework to get that into this clinical trial talk of formatting. So here we have two arms that are written here and the description of the arms, the end of the arms. And again, here we're compiling the, um, the number, which they're calling a percentage of participants in a confidence interval for that N. Um, this is where, you know, as long as your data is clean, if there you have any concerns about this and you're with NANDF, CTU can help you with some of these things, getting it into this, this proper format. But you really want to make sure that you do as much legwork as possible beforehand and getting these things really cleanly specified. And the third example, we have another primary outcome measure as the change in low density LDL, low lipoprotein cholesterol. And this change was calculated at the, as the value at three months minus the value at baseline. Again, so this is really nicely specified here. And we have two time points that are of interest here and three arms. And so the way that you could compile this to report for cp.gov would be with a mean and standard deviation for each of these groups 
across all of those changes in, in LDL within group. And so you could report them neatly here. And then we have the unit of measure at the bottom. Okay, so to summarize, um, outcome measures are obviously a crucial part of your protocol and your research, and they do warrant a lot of planning and careful thought into the specification of these. And again, we talked about a lot of those considerations, but to enumerate some, uh, what procedure will be used to define the outcome? What tests are we using, right? Will the default outcome measure for this procedure, will, will it be reframed into another variable type? You know, talking about binarization of continuous measures. Are we interested in a composite outcome variable or another style of outcome measure? What time frame will that outcome be for? Or what time points are we talking about investigating? Is this outcome measure the primary outcome or rather a secondary or exploratory outcome measure? And how will this choice of outcome measure affect power, scope, generalizability, uh, potential trial success, et cetera? And ultimately, a statistician can help you think through all of these considerations and all of your potential outcomes and determine if they are well-defined enough. And so um, don't feel like you need to do this on your own either. I think that you know it's really good to have this background and the clinicians are going to have the most information about the considerations for outcome measure, but as far as specifying well and talking about power and potential reproducibility, I think that a statistician is really well uh, poised to help with those, those conversations. So I'll stop here for any questions or, um, or thoughts from the group at this point. And I just want to, if, I, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining today. Uh, there's been no questions submitted through the chat. Okay, um, I'm happy to stay on for a minute if anybody thinks of any, um, but I did just wanna pop up this before people sign off, which is going to be the next portions of this lecture series. So next week at the same time, same day, will be a reliability analysis talk given by Dr. Tianxia Wu, and the week following will be me again uh, talking about p-values. So please tune in for those if you are free. Thanks so much, Gina. Thank you, Sandy, for helping coordinate. Recording stopped. Okay, I guess with that, we'll go ahead and end uh, the presentation. But if anyone does have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me or, of course, to Gina as uh, she is our resident expert here. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you all.